The Appalachian Mountains are ancient. They're also beautiful and full of mystery and wonder. They can give life and they can take it. To some, they're a joy and bring peace to their lives. To others, they're a burden, bringing only darkness and terror. Now, I'm a firm believer that there are cryptids living in the Appalachian Mountains, things of yet undiscovered by scientists. Hell, just ask anyone who lives here, and they are likely to have a story of a monster encounter, either personal or a story passed down to them through the family. Now, other things live in the mountains too, things that are not as substantial, not made of flesh and blood. Ghosts spirits, whatever you want to call them. I truly believe that ghosts and spirits roam these archaic mountains because the mountains are so old. Eons have imbued a bit of magic to the stones and trees that allow these entities to remain earthbound. Maybe, well, maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe I'm really just a batshit crazy dude who should be medicated. But I don't think so. I never really believed in ghosts or haints, as they're called around here. I would go along with others when the subject was brought up, but I didn't really believe. And just last year, I developed this unhealthy interest in abandoned, isolated places. I took pictures, but it wasn't for a YouTube channel or any online blog. I know there are literally thousands of people out there exploring abandoned places and posting the results online. It was different for me. I never had an interest of being on camera for any reason. I like being behind the camera, and the results are preserved by me and for me only. These mountains are full of abandoned places. Heck, there are even old mining towns from the early 1800s lying abandoned, forgotten and mostly hidden from the rest of the world. I was hiking last year in the late fall. The leaves had all fallen and bare limbs crisscrossed blackly against the bleak early evening sky. The chilled wind walked through the woods, rattling naked limbs together and rustling dry leaves on the ground. And the old folks say that when the wind is restless, spirits are walking. There were a few other sounds that day, and I shivered as that cold wind whipped around me, caressing the nape of my neck, flapping the bottom of my light jacket against my thigh and whispering by my cheek, just checking me out on its way down the ravine to my left. I watched its progress, marked by the swirl of leaves. I turned to the right, topped the little rise, and and that's when I found an abandoned building that I wanted to capture in photos. I was surprised to find the ruins of the building there. It made no logical sense to me. There were no other buildings nearby. The earth hadn't been leveled much. There would have been no yard to speak of. There were no trails, other than animal trails nearby. So, there would have been no easy way to access the place. And... It sat just a few yards from the slope of the hill I had just climbed. Isolated. Lonely. It had been too large to just serve as a hunter's cabin. My best guess was that it had been a family home. From the dimensions of the remains, I guessed that maybe it had been three or four bedrooms, a kitchen, and a living room when it had been in use. It was situated for superb angle shots. I could get pictures on level ground, from the slope below and the hills to the side and back. The foundation was made of creek rocks. What remained of the walls had been fashioned from rough, hand-hewn trees. The amount of decay was tremendous. Only a fraction of the bare rafters remained overhead, and the walls? Well, they were almost completely gone rotted right down to the creek rock and mortar foundations in most places. Part of the newel post and the skeleton of the staircase stood off-center to the right. A partial door frame stood at the front and another at the side. The chimney rose grandly through the center, but 
Over half of it had crumbled and littered the floor. The charred remains of the last fire still lay inside the fireplace, looking so delicate as to turn to dust if I happened to touch it. A wood-burning cook stove's remains had fallen through the wooden floor in the kitchen. The hole revealed the root cellar. I was excited. Quickly, I took my camera and equipment from my backpack, setting it up for some hasty interior shots before I lost any more of the light from the day. As my flash lit up the interior of the fireplace, I caught a glimpse of an archer on the back wall. In a story, I had heard about a murdered family of five flashed through my mind. It was an old story that I hadn't thought of in years. The family's name was Archer. Had I found the house where a whole family had been murdered over a hundred years ago? Well, I didn't know, but it certainly fueled my excitement. No one had been able to pinpoint the exact location of that house, so I had always thought it was just a story, but maybe not. The wind blew steadily down the hill and over the broken esophagus of the chimney. A ghostly moan issued from the fireplace and the blackened ashes seemed to shudder in its wake. I backed away, shocked by the human sound of it. The wind died, so did the moan. Chuckling, I chided myself not to be such a nervous Nelly as I moved into the kitchen. I snapped a freehand shot of the stove. And for a brief moment, as the camera's flash illuminated the scene, I saw an overlay of a giant maw with jagged teeth wrapped around the stove instead of broken floorboards. I moved to the staircase. It had been nothing fancy, just a straight utilitarian set of stairs to the second floor. The newel post had been gnawed by the elements into a two-foot nub, with no distinguishing features. A creeper vine had weaved through the balusters and over the risers, as if trying to hold the staircase together. As I stepped outside, more of the story returned to me. Three children under the age of eight and two adults in their late twenties had been murdered, and no one had ever been charged with the crime. The fine hairs on the back of my neck stood up as I took in the surroundings. The completely isolated young family living here had been thoroughly isolated. No matter how loud they screamed, there would have been no one to hear them. I shuddered and forced my attention to the sky. The sun dipped slowly toward the west. Dark clouds rolled slowly toward me from the south eating up the blue and leaving nothing but darkness. Using the tripod, I positioned the camera for a heads-on shot of the ruins. As I snapped the test shot, the distinct sound of a woman's light laughter broke the silence. I quickly looked behind me, down the hill, thinking others were likely on the same trail I had used, but I saw nothing. In fact, I heard nothing. Still, I thought it was a good idea to get the shots and head out before I ended up with company that I might not want. I took another shot, feeling as if someone were watching me, staring at me, their gaze boring into my back. And still, no one was there when I looked. Scanning the woods in that direction revealed nothing. No humans and, well, not even an animal. That's when I realized how eerily silent the mountain had gone. Lifting the camera from the tripod, I eased back down the hill, just a bit, to get an upward angle shot of the house framed by the bare trees and a bit of the bleached out sky. I liked the stark, almost black and whiteness of it, so I took several more shots. At the tripod... I froze as I felt something bump against my thigh. There was nothing there. The wind wasn't even blowing. After several seconds, I passed it off as a possible muscle spasm. I had just been standing at an awkward angle on a slope, so it was possible. Slowly, I walked around the corner where there was a partial wall. 
I kept my eyes on the house, looking for a good photo op. The leaves were thick, years of leaves that had repeatedly piled up and rotted down left the ground spongy and difficult to walk over without stumbling. I stepped on glass and the sound was loud as firecrackers in the quiet. Startled, well, I jumped back and nearly dropped the camera. And then, someone giggled. The sound seemed to come from right beside me. I yelped and jumped back another step. The ground gave way under my weight, and I fell into a shallow hole. I say shallow, but I was in the ground from my shoulders down. When I tried to climb out, the ground kept crumbling away, falling into the hole. When a rock fell in, it thudded hollowly against wood. The implication was undeniable. The sound in my mind was unmistakable. It could only mean one thing. Well, I had fallen into a grave and was standing on a wooden coffin. Immediately, there was a moment of panic as I redoubled my efforts to get out. I yelled in disgust and fear, and the sound died a few feet in front of me. The air had grown denser and heavier. When I got out of that hole, thinking I was only scaring myself, I yelled once, sharply, a sound that should have echoed easily in the woods, but it didn't. Again, the sound seemed to hit a wall a few feet in front of me and just die out completely. The nearly black clouds had covered most of the sky overhead. That explained the heavy feel of the atmosphere. I turned back, tracing my steps back to the front of the house. I didn't want to end up in another hole. Did I look into the hole once I got out? Well, hell no. I did not want to confirm my suspicions. I figured by the time I got back home, I would have myself believing it was only a part of another root cellar or something, and that was for the best. I've always been good at using logic to kill any mysterious event in my life. I like to say that I believe in creepy, otherworldly, and unexplained things, but the truth is, it scares the life out of me. I tested the ground with the stick as I walked toward the other side. It wasn't as spongy on that side, and there were even large rocks sticking up from the ground. One boulder in particular was in a perfect position for a snap of the ruins. I climbed onto the rock and sat, positioning my camera perfectly. It was going to be the best shot so far, I thought. Looking through the lens, I centered the staircase and the shot took the picture. I zoomed in and took another, then lowered the camera in front of me, flipping on the digital screen to line it up. As I took the picture, I looked up at the house, smiling at my good fortune to find such a great spot. The lighting from the setting sun was shining brightly into the ruins as the black clouds overhead dimmed the woods on the other side of the house. The result, well, that was an eerie, lonely, sepia-toned photo. The leaves crumbled above and behind me. I looked over my shoulder, up the hill, thinking it might be whoever I heard laugh earlier, but I didn't see anything. It's probably a squirrel, I thought, and I looked back to the house. And that's, that's when I saw her. A tall, thin, willowy woman with a gaunt face. Her dark hair was long and frizzy, and it seemed to float as if in water. Her dress was a faded blue with dark spots blooming over her chest, stomach, and on one thigh. Her eyes were two dark holes as she glared at me from her place by the chimney. Fear froze me to the spot, and my finger held down the button on my camera, causing it to go into record mode. A scream locked in my throat as she opened her mouth to scream too. And my hand loosened on the camera and it slipped. I grabbed for it and stumbled from my perch. The flash activated and in the aftermath, the woman was gone. 
My heart was in my throat and my mind was already off the mountain and heading home. Stumbling backward, I kept my eyes on the interior of the ruins. I left my backpack and tripod where they were. They were replaceable. I just, I just wanted to get the hell out of there. When I reached the point that I had to turn around or risk falling down the hill, I spun, intending to sprint downhill. But a boy of about seven or eight stood there silently, staring wide-eyed up at me. His tousled hair had bits of forest debris caught in the tangles. His eyes were empty black holes. His faded denim clothing was splotched with dark blooms over his torso. And I screamed then. The boy leaned his head back and opened his mouth, imitating a scream. A ragged gash opened up in his neck, just above the collar of his shirt. And I struck out at him. Yeah, <laughs> I know what you're probably thinking, but yes, I swung at a kid. I meant to knock him out of my way, my hand only struck air. Slightly damp and slightly thick air. The apparition dissipated instantly. My hand felt damp and I could see a sheen of water on it. There was a tingling sensation up to the midpoint of my forearm. I tried to run but my legs didn't cooperate and I stumbled to my knees. My forward momentum sent me into dirt-eating flip that ended with me slammed against the trunk of an old oak. My vision blurred. I was aware of the wind singing its lonely song through the branches as I lost consciousness. Now, it wasn't out long because it was still daylight when I opened my eyes again. I was on my side, facing up the hill. All the previous panic and fear had vanished. Getting knocked out will do that. I've discovered anyway. Blinking, I waited for my vision to completely clear. The back of my head and my spine throbbed as I pushed to a sitting position and picked up my broken camera. The trill of laughter brought all the recent horror crashing down on me. I looked up the hill where the sound had come from, and the tall woman stood there, her dress billowing in the wind, her long browned hair flying freely. She reached out to a boy and took his hand both of them laughing as she helped him up the slope. Their clothes were clean. There were no dark, bloody spots in sight, and they seemed normal. I closed my eyes tight, knowing it must have been a hallucination. I counted to five and opened my eyes again. The woman's face was right in front of mine. In a voice that sounded like the wind, she told me, Leave. And she pointed down the mountain, and then she was gone. Just like the dandelion puff in a high wind, she was gone, and so was the boy. It didn't take me long for me to reach the bottom of that mountain, and I'd been staying in my grandfather's old hunting cabin there, but I didn't stop. You see, I got in my truck, and I went to my house. My home right smack in the middle of the city where the constant traffic noise was comforting and where random peals of laughter, while perfectly normal, still give me the creeps and goosebumps to this very day.